Welcome, everybody, to this evening lecture. Before I start with the lecture, I want to ask if there's somebody who wants an interpretation to Swedish. No. Is there somebody who wants an interpretation to Danish? Yes. So, you are free to eat this evening. You got the freedom. <laughs> and how about morality? What's your moral standard, Thomas? <laughs> okay, welcome everybody to this evening lecture. The topic is morality and freedom. And uh, I don't know if you feel any kind of tension between these two words. I guess many of us in at least past lifetimes, and maybe some of you in this lifetime, have experienced uh, preaching about morality that has been kind of like this. So somebody has this experience? And I'm sure that we have it in past lifetimes. And who knows, maybe I have been the priest that had been standing there, <laughs> and the people felt very sinful and went out crying, praying to God to come to heaven instead of hell. So just some images about our past lifetimes, and as we say, some people also in this lifetime. There has been this tension around the word morality. When it comes to freedom, I think for us all that's a very positive word, isn't it? We all want freedom. And uh, I took this image as a background because um, we Scandinavians, after a long winter and after some years with corona, many Scandinavians want to go down to the Mediterra Mediterranean Sea and enjoy the heat and swimming in warm water. Isn't that right? And then you feel that is freedom to just sit on the plane and go down. But uh, it's also a complicated word, this freedom, because there are some rules for freedom also that is in connection with morality. How do we use our freedom? Is it at the expense of others? Then maybe we are tied up and uh, are, there are some obstacles for our freedom in the future. So that is the topic we are going to study here, this lecture. And uh, the final result of this the reflection about these two concepts is that in the very highest level of standard, of moral standards, we will experience total freedom. So in one level, these two words are one and the same, in a way. Some people are so satiated with talks about morality in the churches and maybe in political systems that they don't want to hear about it. But in fact, if we look at it from a cosmological point of view, morality is present in everything. We learn in this spiritual science that there are living beings everywhere. There are only living beings in this universe. And that means that every little action I take, every little thought I have or feeling I have, it influences other living beings. So how can I live without practicing one type of moral standard? Everything is connected with morality. So it's really the science of the sciences, you could say. Martinez describes this when we ask the question, what is morality? There is one quote that we often come back to when we talk about this topic. Morality is thus the beginning guideline in controlling thought climates 
in the same way as science is the beginning guideline in controlling physical climates. So in principle, morality is the same with regard to the creation of thought as science is with regard to physical creation. And we know that uh, we are really, we have to really be very perfect in our physical science to send uh, a rocket to the moon or to March or, <coughs> or uh, to create a computer. And now Jonas was up installing something new here for me right before the lecture and I hope it will function. And I do rely on his knowledge because there's a science behind all these things. And there has been mathematical investigations about the perfection of so much in the physical world. And that is really a joy and blessing for us that we have this possibility to have this physical science to help us in the physical world. But of course, it must be the same thing with the mental climates and the possibility to create a world of peace, a world of neighborly love, it's also totally dependent on science. And that is what spiritual science is about, to give us the knowledge to be more precise and accurate in the effects and knowledgeable about the effects of our thoughts, our feelings, our actions. And to remember that everything I do influences the surroundings, the living beings in microcosmos, in macrocosmos, in mesocosmos. We are totally dependent on each other in everyday life and we are influencing each other all the time. And how about uh, freedom? Shall we look at some definitions and some reflections about what is freedom? As we said in the start here with the image from Greece, it's often the longing to be able to satisfy your own longings. And we have this dilemma that it's a question of how we satisfy our longings. Is it only a joy or blessing for everybody around us, or is it at the expense of others? And here Martinus shows his, us in his spiritual science that we need to experience this freedom of will, the expression of our will, and also that it will be obstructed, because this is the contrast that makes us aware as an individual, as a creative being, that we can may see the difference if I act in harmony with the laws of life or go against the laws of life. And he describes it in this quote. Without the experience of the two contrasts, the freedom of will and the obstruction of the will. No being whatsoever would ever be able to experience being an independent, sovereign individuality. It would have no more consciousness than a wheel in a machine. But the living being has something that a wheel does not have. It has consciousness. And from a cosmic point of view, at its highest stage, sovereign free will. So at the highest stage, from a cosmic perspective, we have totally free will. We are creating our fate. And I guess that's not really how we experience it in everyday life. We have some experience of the obstruction of our will in different situations. And that is quite a natural state to be in, where we are in this evolution, where we have been kind of buried in matter, you could see. 
In the spiral cycle, we have this journey through all these kingdoms. And there is this process of going into matter through the mineral kingdom, the plant kingdom, and in the animal kingdom. That's an enormous journey when we start to create in the physical matter. And it goes so far that we even mentally believe that we are matter. And here we are in this struggle for life, of self-preservation in the animal kingdom that makes us survive through eating other beings and to kill other beings. We are involved in the killing principle. So there we really are creating blockages for the expression of free will because everything goes in cycles and comes back to ourselves. And now we are in a state, stage of the evolution where we are evolving instead of involving in matter. We are evolving out of matter. And we are becoming more aware of our consciousness and start to see the effects of our thoughts and our actions. So we are in an awakening process where we start to experience more of the possibility of creating out of a free will. And we have a deep, deep longing for this freedom in different areas of life. But there is one analysis we need when we look at this word picture. And it is this uh, dual analysis of the word picture where we, on one hand, has the eternal dimension of life. And on the other hand, we have the temporal aspect of life. And the eternal aspect of life, it is eternal. So we have no possibility to change that with our will. Because it is the structure of life, as we see here. And the spiral cycle is also a part of the eternal structure of life. It is within us, so to say, our eternal structure. So we have these seasons, going into matter and darkness, going up to the light and be free and be one with God. That's a cycle that we cannot influence with our will. If we could, the cosmos would be totally chaotic. There would be no evolution. There would be no possibility to create consciousness. So the eternal dimension of life, it is not blocking our will. It is a prerequisite. It is a precondition for having a will. If we compare it with a physical world, if there was no gravitation, we would not be able to stand. We would not be able to create a body that is relating to this physical world. So the gravitation is not in conflict with creating. No, it's the prerequisite for being able to create on this planet and in this physical realm. So the eternal aspects is a precondition for us to be able to use our free will. So it's the temporal aspect of life where we can use our will, where we can act and influencing, influence the way we experience and create life. Martinez expresses this like this. The principle of hunger and satiation is thus the organic automatism that facilitates the emergence and regulation of the will. So there is this organic process through the spiral cycle, an eternal rhythm. And in within this spiral cycle, we have our free will to create the variation that we want and that we uh, want to experience in everyday life. So Martinus concludes, the variations in the fate of the being are products of its own activated free will. So the fact that I'm standing here with my body and this shirt and 
these thoughts and giving this lecture is the result of my free will, this variation. And when I look at you, we are all different. We have our variation of body and expression and feelings and uh, thoughts and our history. And that's a result of the way we have been using our free will, lifetime after lifetime. So how we create our fate, our personality and so on, everything is a result of the use of our free will. So, <clears throat> when we are acting into life, we have this flowing of energy out of our system, sending out energy, creating, and everything we send out to the universe, it comes back to ourselves. Martinus says that the law of fate determines precisely that we can have free will only in the extent that we, with our own free will, do not obstruct other beings' normal use of their free will. So that is really the golden rule, you could say. And we have heard about this golden rule in all the religions in many, many lifetimes. We see it around the world. And uh, the same thought that the way you act towards others will influence the way you will self-experience your life. And it's interesting, if you listen to these, many of these uh, near-death experiences, they say the same thing. That when they see their life review, and they really also get to experience the, the, how they have influenced the other beings, and when they rest in this realm of totally neighborly love that they talk about, they come back and say that this golden rule is not an invention of mankind. It is the way life it is. Life is. It's not invented. That's the way it is. It's like Newton, he didn't invent gravitation. He saw it through the apple and so on. He was studying life and saw there is gravitation. He could describe it. It was there all the time before he uh, saw it. But uh, it's the same thing with this the law of life, with karma. It's just the way it is. And we hear that also from near-death experiencers. But we know also there are talent kernels behind all these actions. We build up a personality, we build up our way of living, and we are walking on the ladder of evolution, step by step up. And it's not a question of will that you just want to be another person or you want to be, tomorrow I want to be a perfect loving being and so on. Or I want to play the piano like a genius. We know that there is this A, B, C process. So it is a gradual process to grow through life. What kind of energies do I send out in my dialogue with the universe? And that's also why the morality that we can see in this cosmic worldview, it stresses that intolerance is one of the biggest burdens on the faith of mankind. That we have this way of, like an automatic function from the animal kingdom, that we are so aware of how the other beings should behave. And we have been moralizing in so many lifetimes towards each other. And that has been kind of a part of the self-preservation for the flock, for the herd, that we have been holding together and we have been looking up so that people doesn't behave in a wrong way. And all this moralizing is probably a reason why we are studying this morality that has the purpose to free each other from this tendency of intolerance. All these conflicts where we are so sure that we know what is right and how the other ones should behave. 
But when we learn about the ladder of evolution and we know we learn about the basis for be able, be able to understand, for instance, with your heart, is a result of your own experiences. So if I shout at somebody I think in, is so stupid that they can't do that or understand that, it's like shouting on a flower that they are yellow or green or whatever. Because people in their inside, they are like a flower. They are in a, on a certain stage of evolution. They have their expression. And so fighting on the outer world other beings and trying to conform them into what I mean is the right morality, that is really the biggest burn, burning fire on this planet. And that's really something to we can train with our self-reflection to inhibit all these impulses to correct everybody else and to criticize the others and to slander about others who are not as I want them to be. So there's a big area of not acting out of intolerance. But it's also interesting to see that the other aspect of this is how do we react when we are ourselves offended or in criticized by other beings? How can I build a way of reacting where I am not involved in this? And um, there is a book in Danish that is called The Structure of Cooperation. It's a result of a lot of dialogues in the council the last couple of years with Martinus. And he was very eager to note that they should note down and put the tape recorder on and listen about how to cooperate and how to work together in a good way. And he says, this is not a cause where money should be in the focus. We need to have money to create this place, and we need gifts to create it, and we need all these volunteers that are working here. But what we are working with is, in a way, the standard of morality, as he says in this quote. That's what we are working on, living up to a standard of morality. Who can live up to it the most? Who is the best at putting up with an insult, who is never offended. I think that's a very sp special way of talking about this, that uh, who is the best of putting up with an insult. So that's a talent to train in everyday life. How do I react? How can I handle this in a peaceful way when people are insulting me, offending me, or writing on the social media about me, or whatever it is that is going on in this time? Because, in a way, I guess, maybe rumors have never been so quickly spread around the world as it is right now, for instance, with social media. And so many people are hanged out <laughs> in front of the scene, upon the scene, so to say. So we are really, many of us, training to relate to this without being offended. And we know from this word picture and Martinus Symbols, also on the front page of his main works, with this forgiveness, that that is the consequence of the eternal word picture, that everything should be forgiven. We know that, as we see with the heart and the hands here, we can only change our fate through turning the other cheek, that means not physically, <laughs> but mentally, turning the humane side till when we are offended or insulted or criticized or attacked in different ways. Can we handle it with a friendly way? Maybe we have to be very firm. Maybe we need to say no. Maybe we need to go away from you go to the right and I go to the left. But the energy within us, we can be more and more creative to find a way of doing it in a, in a friendly and forgiving way. So that is the key to the
the new world where we see all the skies disappearing on this planet. That is the road to initiation, to freedom and to peace on earth. It's interesting to see in this book called The Grand Course, or Grand Course, or Stor Course in Posvensk. There it is 15 lectures that he had in the 50s that he wanted to give an overview of the word picture. And uh, quite a bit into this, these lectures, he comes to this conclusion. He says, we have now come so far in this course that we must look at that which is particularly necessary in relation to the reason for holding this course. Namely, that one must come to see that there is justice in life, that no one suffers injustly, unjustly, and that no one can do anything unjust. And that is really a tough one to swallow. And I guess that's why I say we have come so far into this course that now we can look at this fact. And if we look at what's going on, for instance, in Ukraine or in Syria or Yemen or Afghanistan or around the world, and also personal <coughs> fates around us, it can be very hard to swallow that pill, so to say. But when we really go deeper and deeper into the understanding of the word picture, and especially the law of karma and reincarnation, we can see that we all go through the same amount of darkness. And it is not a punishing for anything. There's no sin, as we heard also this morning. But there are lessons to learn. And to create an animal with this self-preservation to become a real human being, that is a process, in fact, over thousands of lifetimes. Some lifetimes are very harsh and tough, and some are more peaceful. But in the whole, we will get the same amount of education, you could say, in neighborly love, in compassion, and training of our intelligence to create thought climates that are in harmony with the laws of life. And there is one specific area that, for me, is very helpful when I look at the word and the suffering in the word to understand the karmic relation, for instance, in war situations. And that is when he shows us, which is, in fact, fairly new in our revolution, to hear that the way we relate to animals is just as important to become peaceful as it is with other human beings. So the karmic laws also are related to the way we act towards animals. And if we look at the fact that billions of animals are killed on this planet every week, not only every year, but every week, if you count them all. And if we look at the way they are treated in these factories and how their offsprings is taken away from them, and uh, how they live in ways that are totally unnatural for them. Then I think it's much easier for us to understand why there are wars on this planet, and what's, going, what's happening now in Ukraine and so on. Many people are tired of wars, but there is a war going on towards the animals. And the only way to create the compassion that also embraces the animals, is that we have experiences enough of the same type of fate. And that is really the very, very important part of the awakening. If we want freedom on this planet, we also have to create freedom for a natural life for all the animals. So that's a really big, big responsibility that the spiritual science now is showing us and opening up for us. But once again, we have to remember 
that all these steps of evolution, they are natural steps of evolution. If we are not there now, we have been there. We all have to go through all these steps of evolution. There is nothing wrong on the planet, but there are a lot of lessons to learn. And there's a lot of process of awakening going on on this planet right now. Martins writes that 2,000 years have now passed since such a perfect human being in flesh and blood wandered among people and reveal, revealed his divine way of being and his oneness with the Godhead. But nevertheless, it is only now that paganism, which means world wars and the Antichrist or materialism, to a particular extent gets on people's nerves and that here and here one begins to understand that there is something wrong with people's very existence. I think it's so interesting to see this process. We heard about, we saw Jesus and heard about him for 2,000 years. And we have been keeping on with all these wars and killing. But now it is really getting on our nerves. That's why we also see that a lot of the soldiers coming home from war they commit suicide. They can't handle what they have done. They have been acting far below their moral standard. They come in such a psychological conflict, they can't stand living anymore with their PTSD and their bad conscience. So that's really an image to see this step of evolution where we have to start to look at the old habits and see that creating war, real wars, military wars, but also the wars in economics right now that is making so many people come into very, very bad situation, people starving around the planet, it is getting more and more on people's nerves. We can't handle it anymore, and that is really a stressful situation, but that is also the step towards the transformation. And we are really in a kind of crescendo, you could say, in the evolution, an awakening where more and more people start to see that there is something wrong. We have to change the way we live together on this planet. And there are some structures <coughs> still imminent within us, from the animal kingdom. Martinus is talking about the change, the polar, uh, uh, the, the polar, polar verwandling, the, the transformation of the poles. <laughs> and he says that's the fundamental power behind our big change. And we can see that we have lived thousands of lifetimes with this feeling of ownership of our partner and our possessions and with jealousy. And we have lived thousands of years also with marital traditions. So it's in our backbone, you could say, these old habits from the animal kingdom with possessions and jealousy and all these traditions that we now more and more are in conflict with. If we go back in time, people could be stoned to death for infidelity or homosexuality. And we are sorry to see that still in some parts of the world this is going on. But it's getting on our nerves. There is such a big longing for a big change. We heard it 2,000 years ago, a totally new morality to love thy neighbor. And we can see that this collision of different ideals of morality and freedom, it is this transformative power you can see within us. And there are so many moral dilemmas and conflicts that we are struggling with. And that is really also kind of a part of this accelerated ev evolution we see on this planet. And uh, the effect is also within us, as Martinus describes in this 
book on funerals in this quote. The consequence of this is that they make extensive use of ancient thought climates, ideas, whose energy-generating nature can be regarded only as normal magnetism or vital force for organisms in low primitive animal stages, which the terrestrial human beings with the highest part of their consciousness have long since actually left behind. Thus, between terrestrial human organisms and thought climates, there is a corresponding degree of disharmony. So when we now for thousands of years have been studying about neighborly love, when we have really trained our intellectual capacity, going to school and learn a lot of things, and the faculty of intelligence is streaming through our body, and the humane feeling have grown, and we are creative with music and art and so on. There are so many highly vibrating thought climates within our system that have been growing through lifetimes. And that has really refined and changed our bodies. And that's why we cannot cope with these old thought climates. Many people can realize that if they really get angry and have this outburst of anger, they are shivering afterwards. They can't tolerate it anymore. And people walking around in bitterness or jealousy, they can also feel that it creates anxiety and depression. We cannot cope with that anymore. We have to find a way of working ourselves out of these thought climates. And that is the purpose, what we are studying here with the spiritual science, to get a science about our thoughts and feelings and actions, so that we more and more can come in harmony with the laws of life. But we have this very basic conflict within us. He says, thus the animal kingdom and the real human kingdom each has its own individual form of sexuality, which accordingly creates either animal or human capacities and tendencies. So the sexuality within us, we have two types. We have this inheritance from the animal kingdom with mating and the copulation act to get an offspring and the self-preservation and jealousy around that, the ownership. And we have a new type of sexuality where we are enjoying caressing, kissing, hugging, and also music and art and humane activities. That's also a new type of sexuality that can make our body shiver of joy, so to say. And we are, have both these types of enjoying life. And they are more or less also in a mixed structure for us swings beings. So that's kind of the basic analysis behind what he calls the unhappy marriages zone the zone of the unhappy marriages. Because we mix these two types of sexuality. and We mix them because that's a way of getting more and more aware what is going on in our relationships. He describes it in this way. And then neighborly love or the new sympathy is no longer in a state of pure cultivation. Now it is sexually infected with sympathetic feelings for mating. And these sympathetic feelings for mating are infected by the sympathy of neighborly love. And in one place in his text, he writes that when a couple is in a sexual act, the copulation act from mating, getting an offspring, so to say, and they at the same time want to kiss each other, they are in this mixture of two words because the old animal action in the copulation act, so to say, it is the sexual organs meeting. But when we have the longing for kissing and caressing each other, it's a new sexuality. And this makes us so confused in many relationships 
Because if we have a good friendship also with the other sex, if we are heterosexual, sexual, then uh, it's natural to feel that you want to caress and uh, maybe kiss and hug these friends. But then it very easily can connect with the old structure of sexuality. And that's where we get confused. And we are in a process of learning what morality is connected with the new sexuality and what morality is connected with the old sexuality. And when we here learn about neighborly love, the question is, how can I express my sympathy in these different areas without expressing it at the expense of others? When do I really feel that this is a mutual connection, where we both are happy for the type of energy that we are expressing in this relationship, so that we don't hurt other beings, that it is a benefit for everybody around us? So that is a big, big learning process and a very important process to learn if we are discussing this question about morality and freedom. And uh, it's not enough with learning about it theoretically, as we know. We have to go through these practical experiences. We have to do the mistakes. It's nothing wrong with that. That's how we get the theoretical knowledge into our heart. Martinez describes it in the book Logic in this way. The lessons of life have to be experienced in practice. One cannot get away with manifesting a higher state as mere cerebral acquired research or training. One must also be able to express it with one's heart and feeling as an innate 100% individual nature and personal experience. So the daily experience are nourishing our new morality and are nourishing the morality we are studying here. So if we do so-called mistakes, we can start to look at it as, as necessary experiences to grow as a human being and understand it with our heart and not only with our brain. And we are all standing in a lot of choices all the time in so many different areas. And there is this fantastic archetypal piece of theater when Pilate is standing with Jesus Christ and he knows that uh, he is innocent. He knows that he is the one who has the truth. But in front of him, of him there, there is this big flock, the herd, and people shouting that he should give Barabbas free and crucify Christ. And there's also the establishment with the priests who say that if you don't give Barabbas free, we will not call, but talk to the, do you say, Caesarean in Rome. Is that the name? Caesar, the emperor of Rome. And then he starts to feel threatened in his position. And that's a fantastic piece of theater we look at here, because this is an expression of how we are in choices every day, many, many, many times. Shall I let Christ go free and do the humane action? Or shall I follow the flock and the old traditions that maybe have a much lower morality in many situations? And in so many areas, how we eat, relation to animals, our health, drinking, whatever, and gossiping, all these things where we try to conform to the flock, we have a possibility sometimes to wake up and see, is there another way? Is there a more peaceful way of living? Can I act in another way and give Christ free? And as we said before, it's not only a question of theory. We have to know it from our heart, what is right and what is wrong. If we are kind of in the middle, between all these, have not stabilized our new understanding, 
we can very easily be influenced by the flock. And it's interesting with this dialogue between Christ and Pilate, Jesus says, everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. To be of the truth is to have the experiences, to know by experience, emotionally, what is right and what is wrong. But Martinus says it's not only knowing by your personal experiences. You have to understand them, to intellectualize them. And that is the purpose of spiritual science, that we, with the spiritual science and this higher morality, can look at our experiences, and when we do that, we strengthen and stabilize our inner pillar of light. The inner voice is easier and easier to hear the more you integrate your experiences with this higher type of knowledge, with this spiritual science. So if we look at this process of the liberation through morality, it's a question of coming in harmony with the laws of life. And we see it is a very, very long journey. We raised up two legs thousands of years ago, Martinus says. And we have been these things in this conflict so many lifetimes. And we have been learned for different type of moral standards on every step of evolution. And we have been in conflict and have to go on and free from the flock and find a new way to go. And we are now in a state of evolution where we are more and more aware that we have the possibility to make our own choice. And with the strengthening of the spiritual science, we can get nourishment to this inner pillar of light, this growing Christ consciousness within us, so it will be more and more a force within us that makes us strong enough in everyday life to follow this new moral standard. And the conclusion in this process is that the true normal free will constitutes every being's will that is completely in contact with God's will. And for many people, that sounds like a contradiction. Am I first free when I only do God's will? But if God's will is that we should learn about the laws of life and what is neighborly love, then it is the goal with our whole process. And then it's a question of coming in harmony with the laws of life, in the same way as the physical signs have helped us to create all these fantastic things on this planet, computers and cars and whatever, <clears throat> and the mobile telephones and all these ingenious things. There's a science behind it. And now, if you really understand the science of life, we have the possibility to create from out of love, and we will see that then we are in harmony with the will of God, and then we will experience freedom. Because from the highest perspective, morality and freedom is one and the same. And I will end with this quote. Human freedom is the freedom to demonstrate a loving attitude to everything and everyone, regardless of what one meets from other people. It is the only thing that liberates people from the jungle of the animal kingdom. And it is this force that creates peace in the minds of human beings and then on earth. Thank you. <clears throat>